know, I became um, a college president the way many careers happen uh, by accident. I never thought about being a college president. I didn't grow up thinking that's what I wanted to do. In, in fact, it never occurred to me. Staying in graduate school in the ordinary sense didn't seem the right route. I applied for and got a fellowship to become an intern in the city government of New York. The Board of Education and its staff had no use for me at all. I was, you know, this graduate student intern, and uh, they did what the best they could, which was to put me in a closet. You know, I looked incompetent, young, and dangerous. And so what best to do is bury me. The school board was new, and it fumbled some obligations that it had to fulfill demanded by the legislature of the state of New York. And sometime in the fall, the mayor got wind of this, not through me. I was completely oblivious. No one, people had forgotten. You know, I was upstairs in, in the attic. That was it. And um, an emergency meeting was called with the whole board to review where they were in compliance with this state law. And the mayor, Mayor John Lindsay, said, wait a minute, didn't we send some graduate student from, from Harvard here? You know, some, where, where, you know, you guys look like you need more help. You know, where is this guy? And everybody didn't know I existed. So the chief of staff of the thing, who knew where I was, he was the guy who put me in the closet. Um, he said, well, uh, and the mayor said, well, bring him here. So out of the blue, out of the blue, um, I got a knock on my door and a very agitated uh, secretary of the board says, you're wanted right away in the conference room, the mayor is here. So I put my stupid filing down and I walked with him into the conference room and the mayor had a sense of humor. And um, so he said, uh, yeah, aren't you this guy? You're on one of these fellows that came. And I said, yes, he said, uh, uh, he, said, he, said, he said, what do you know about computers? And somehow, you know, the good Lord spoke to me, and I realized, I mean, I didn't know anything about computers, but nobody else in the room did, right? So I wasn't going to get an examination on a computer language. And I knew, you know, if this had consequences, I had a lot of friends at MIT and other places. Lesson number one of good leadership is know whom to call. <clears throat> so I said, well, I, I don't, don't know a lot, but I'm reasonably oriented. I said some kind of murky thing. Yeah, that's good, he says. And what do you know about demography? Demography, you know, population. Now, that I knew a little bit more because I was a graduate student in social history. So I said, well, I, I know more about demography than I know about computers. Comparing nothing with nothing, you know, it's less nothing than the previous. And um, he turned to me and he said, put him in charge. I don't know what he's talking about. And there was silence in the room. The meeting came to an end. And I found myself in charge. And the reason I got this opportunity, because I figured life is an adventure. Take a risk, you know. I could have said, I know nothing about it, Your Honor. Let me go back to my filing. And the improvisation ended with my getting this, turned out to be significant task and a real job. And I then became the chief of staff to the board. And it's from there that um, I got recruited by Tim Healy, who later became president of Georgetown, to work for the Board of Higher Education for the City University. And at the same time, John Kennedy, the president of Dartmouth College, uh, wanted to protect an experimental college in New Hampshire called Franconia College. And it was facing closure but its closure was motivated by politics. And one thing led to another, and he persuaded me to take over this bankrupt college as a president. And so that's how I became a college president. I was 
was helped by a lot of short-term publicity about my age, you know, young college president. I was on all the evening talk shows and in Playboy magazine. It was totally, it was totally, it was a lark. It was a, like a joke. And from there, a senior who was on the presidential search committee at Bard knew through his parents about me and approached me about uh, being a candidate for the Bard presidency, which had come open. And um, I got the job, but only after they had offered it to two other people who turned it down. So they hired me, really, out of desperation. The moral of this tale is two. Moral number one is forget about the paved road that's right in front of you. If you have to make a detour, that's the time to make a detour. The detour could be a dead end, right? You have to pull out the same way you came in. Or worse, you have to trek your way back to the road, you know, through brush. But the detour could lead to a whole, whole different road. And you don't want to regret not having taken that detour if there's something about it that is interesting. The second um, lesson is to seek advice from the best people you can find and then try to figure it out yourself. Don't close your ears to advice and let hear the people out, even if you know what they're going to say, even if they're going to say something you can predict the next word. If someone tells you to pick the apple from the tree, they might tell you why or how to do it in a different way from the last person. You'll learn something by a repetition of something you already think you know. When I was offered the presidency of both Bard and Franklin, my academic advisors told me I was going to essentially end my academic career by taking an administrative post, that I was um, jumping ship, could never climb back on. Um, I got all kinds of advice. I got advice that the college would close, both Bard and Frank Cordy, both, would close within the first year, and that I would have um, the responsibility on, on my on my shoulders, so to speak, for having failed. That the risks were too great. The reason people didn't take the job at bar that I was offered in fact, only they couldn't find anybody to take the job at all. I was the only choice. I used to joke that I was twenty three, but the best candidate would have been twelve. You know, but in the bar job, the Someone mid-career who had family and children, I had small children, but who was mid-career in their 40s or 50s, um, and this was their last step or second to last step, and their first shot at being a college president, that's what they wanted to do, would have been a provost and a dean and climb the ladder in the normal uh, academic corporate way. For them, the Bard was too much of a risk in 1975, or too much, and so they turned it down. But I was 27, you know, uh, when they approached me. And that's a time where you can scramble back. You can fall into a hole and climb out. Early in my career as a college president, um, I became concerned about the relationship of higher education to secondary education. I became concerned, as many educators have before me, with the connection. Too few of our young people go to college. Too few of our young people prepare to go to college. And in fact, there is an abysmal um, dropout rate. So then the country has continued to invent the community college system, the two-year college, which is a colossal failure because its primary obligation is remedial. They're trying to do something that should have been done five years earlier teach people how to read, uh, fundamental mathematical literacy, you know, basic skills which would enable them to pursue, let's say, a higher education uh, or a job that required technical skills. And there's no doubt that in our century, knowledge is the key of economics, whether it's through artificial intelligence, whether it's through 
uh, the use of computation, um, that there are fewer and fewer jobs out there that are meaningful that um, require no education. So as a college president, I thought um, there's something wrong with this. It might be that if we started college earlier, not at 18, but at 16, because today's 16-year-old is, from the developmental point of view, the moral equivalent of the 18-year-old of the 1930s. And that if you treated them seriously, you didn't run a high school the way a prison is run. Uh, if you didn't simply oppress them with a regimented, standardized, you know, uh, cut and paste learning, road learning, you know, teaching them how to pass some multiple choice exam, and making them memorize a lousy textbook, but actually expose them to the beauty and excitement of learning, which the only people who can do are people who are trained in fields, mathematics, physics, chemists. So if you want, you want to learn about physics and mathematics, you know, be inspired by a real mathematician, a real physicist, not a teacher. That's okay for elementary school, but it's not for an adult. We got the opportunity in 79 to take over Simon's Rock, a residential early college. And our experience there and the data we accumulated uh, led me to write a book um, about American education, which came out in the 90s, late 90s. There was a chapter in the book in which I argued for the abolition of the American high school. I argue that high school should be abolished. And the way to do that is to get rid of junior high school and middle school in the normal sense, have a two-tier system, elementary, K through six, and then seven through 10, and end high school at the end of the 10th grade. And then there would be other options for students. And um, it was a radical proposal. And I argue that the culture of the high school is corrosive. And um, that book appeared before the Columbine shooting. And some journalist remembered that he had just thrown away a book which called for the abolition of the American high school and was very critical of the culture, curriculum, and uh, performance of the American public high school. And there is a, was a great uh, academic physician who quipped that the most important medical instrument is a retrospectoscope. <laughs> you always are right after the fact. So there are a lot of pundits, you know, opining about what was wrong with the American high school. And this guy realized somebody just written about this before the event. It wasn't calculating retrospectively a diagnosis. So he got in touch with me. One thing led to another. I wrote an op-ed piece for the Times and and Oprah Winfrey got interested. That's the way things work. And she devoted an entire program to me and to the idea and to this book. And the chancellor of the city school system in New York, Harold Levy, he told his staff, let's meet this guy who wrote this book. And we met in New York in March of 2001 in a diner in New York. And we talked about the idea. At the end of the breakfast, um, Howard Levy says to me, how would you like to open a public early college? And our idea was to create a, a 10, 11, 12, uh, 9, 10, 11, 12 grades. And by the end of the last 12th grade, you could, if you had the wherewithal, finish a two-year college degree, the same degree you get from a community college, an AA degree, tuition-free, it's a public school, and that the high school diploma would be given by the city, and Bart would give the AA degree. So how do you say, would you like to do that? Well, it was a dream. I dreamed for years about getting all the experience we had that we had accumulated in dealing with the younger age group uh, with a college curriculum, um, and do it in the public sector. So I said, yes, but I didn't realize what he was saying. Because I said, well, you know, it's March 2001. 
we can open in the fall of 2002, right? And he looked at me and said, are you stupid? He said, we have a deal, but only if you open the September. Open a new, innovative, hybrid high school, early college, in April, May, June, July, in four months. Now, it sounded preposterous, but the lesson I had learned many years earlier applied. I looked at him, I said, okay, but we have one condition. You have to have the building. He said, no problem. He, of course, was lying. He didn't have a building. But, you know, he was gambling too, because he was probably gambling, this guy's not going to deliver, so I don't have to come up with a building, so why not say yes, All right? But we delivered, and he had to come up with a building. But, and then we had no money. Bart's not a rich place, and so we didn't have money for this. And I called the Gates Foundation. They promised a million dollars to us on the telephone to get this thing started. And we got started. We opened a couple of days before 9-11. Had Harold Levy not insisted on opening it while he was still chancellor, before tame term came to an end in November, it would never have gotten started because 9-11 happened. Now we have eight public high school, early colleges are very successful, two in New York, <clears throat> one in Newark, one in Cleveland, one in Baltimore, one in Washington, one in New Orleans, and one in the Hudson. <laughs> The most important thing I've learned is that nothing serious and important can be done in a short amount of time. The reason many of our institutions languish is there is no stability of leadership. Superintendents come and go. There really is no real innovation in the university sector is that the average length of a college or university president is seven years. Right? And seven years is a nanosecond in the life of an institution, unless the institution is simply to be managed. But if you have a job, <clears throat> which is to change or dramatically improve or alter something within an institutional framework, the thing I've learned is that you have to take the long view. You can't do what some, you know, equity investors and hedge funds do, buy a company and sell it. Maximizing profit in the short term is not compatible with fundamental innovation and change. Uh, from the economic point of view, is that the financing of American higher education is reaching, reaching a crisis. So you see it in the controversy over the loan forgiveness, and you see it in the rising tuition, which is compensated for by a very rapidly rising discounting of that tuition through financial aid. It's a collective social public responsibility to finance that individual who has the skill set and the preparation to go to higher education. But what we now face is a crisis of affordability and the ability to maintain high quality research and teaching facilities and personnel. And uh, the second crisis is a crushing and narrow-minded idea of what higher education can do for the young adult. The idea that the liberal arts are impractical and a waste of time and foolish and uh, useless, that parents um, feel that you know they're sending their child in order for them to get a job. Uh, and that's the right thing for a parent to do. But what they don't realize is that the statistics show that the liberal arts graduates have a better record of employment and continue employment and um, pay. That a good liberal arts program is anything but useless. Um, it allows you to improvise, to develop careers, to change careers, uh, to innovate in your career. So there's a misunderstanding 
And the third thing is that our colleges and universities aren't doing the job. You know, the big universities are giving teaching to graduate students um, that the research universities aren't really doing what they should in undergraduate education, even graduate education. And that there has to be um, a reinvestment of our best people in teaching and curriculum and the constructive use of technology in that as well. So, you know, there's a lot to fix. Um, and uh, it's fixable. <laughs> Managing faculty is um, requires that you respect, understand, and have affection for the vocation they have chosen. Someone is devoted to spend her life studying astrophysics. Someone has decided to spend their life um, writing poetry or writing about poetry or writing a biography of some writer who died 200 years ago. These are ideas, ambitions, which have no commercial reward. They can't be doing it for the money. And it requires the same length of training that an engineer, longer, or lawyer, or doctor gets, and they don't get paid as much. So... The most important thing is to understand, appreciate, and encourage their idealism. Encourage them to place value in what they're doing and to be sympathetic to their needs so that you can help provide them what they want and they deserve. The second is to not overestimate your capacity to persuade them and never waste their time. And the one thing faculty resent is the absence of transparency and candor. I would say to most college graduates, if you can find a way, get a job, and live in a place that you want to be, so that you can take a closer look at the thing you think you want to do. So you take a job that gives you a bird's eye view of law, medicine, government service. If you have a dream that can only be pursued when you're in your 20s, try it out. Don't live with the regret. But remember to do it for a limited time because most, not all, college graduates, not most, let's say half, will find themselves needing to go back to school for further training and certification. If they're in that kind of um, world, they need to re-enter school while they're, the speed of their learning is still very high. And to return to graduate school or professional school sooner rather than later. What saved me, uh, what the single most important attribute in my career, are intuition and an ability to defend that intuition about what the right thing to do is, what needs doing, and an ability to change one's mind about that if necessary. The ability to, to act on your beliefs. And the other is the ability to think in a way that you have the sense that you're not simply imitating somebody else. To allow your imagination uh, in a disciplined way to look at an issue, a problem, and to be led by, by, uh, by ideas, some sense of how things that you think are important could be done better. Oh, 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 oh,